Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Daniel Prophecy Seminar, Studies in the Book of Daniel. Uh, this is Friday night. I'm Pastor Ed Anderson, and we have been studying for the last four weeks um, the book of Daniel. We are now in week five, and so I want to welcome all those who are joining us for uh, the study. Uh, tonight, we're going to be taking a look at this conflict that we are presented with in the book of Daniel over false worship. Um, but before we do, let us take a quick little quiz, uh, and this is based on uh, last week's lesson. So if you missed last week's lesson, you can um, go to the recordings, and I've been able to post those up on my YouTube channel site. So I will make sure that you will be able to get to those links in the um, in this in this Facebook uh, page that you're watching. But you can also look for it on Future of Hope. Um, I'm trying to get 100 subscribers so I can actually make it really easy for people to find it um, just by going to youtube.com. But if you look in there and just type in my name or um, um, Future of Hope, you should be able to get that or click on a link that uh, you should be able to find here in this Facebook page. So let's ask this first question. The book of Daniel contains many outline prophecies that outline world history from Daniel's time to the time of the end. Is that true or is that false? Okay, let's take a look at question number two. The Babylonian wise men devised a false interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but fortunately Daniel gave correct interpretation. Is that true or is that false? All right, so the question number three, the head of gold in Daniel two represented the nation of Babylon of which Nebuchadnezzar was the king. All right, so again, this is review from last week. If you missed it, you can look at the video. Question four, the stone that crushed the image represents an atomic bomb that the United States drops on Russia. All right, is that true or is that false? And finally, question number five, the progression of the empires found in Daniel 2 indicates that God is in full control of human events. Is that true or false? Okay, let's look at the answers and let's take a look at question number one. Uh, true or false? The book of Daniel contains many outline prophecies that outline world history from Daniel's time to the time of the end. The answer to that is true. That is exactly right. So Daniel were, uses a type of um, biblical um, um, way of presenting prophecy and that's called the historical outline view so we'll find the same prophecy repeated throughout the book of daniel but as you progress through daniel um, god starts to give us deeper focus a little bit more and more on details of that prophecy especially for those of us in the end all right let's take a look at question number two the babylonian wise men devised a false interpretation of nebuchadnezzar's dream but fortunately, Daniel gave correct interpretation. What do you think? Is that true or false? The answer is false. That is correct because remember, the Babylonian wise men had to tell the king what he actually dreamed. And the king forgot his dream and the Babylon, Babylonian wise men couldn't give a false interpretation because they didn't know what the dream was. Only Daniel was given that from God. Okay, let's take a look at question number three. The head of gold in Daniel 2 represented the nation of Babylon, of which Nebuchadnezzar was the king. And the answer to that, of course, is true. So as we look at the metals in that Daniel chapter 2 uh, image, it, each metal represented a kingdom that would, that would rise and fall. All right, let's look at question 4. The stone that crushed the image represents an atomic bomb that the United States drops on Russia. And the answer, of course, is false. Uh, that is definitely just... Um, I threw that in there just see if I can throw you guys off, but you know that that's not what it represented. Okay, question number five. The progression of the empires in Daniel 2 indicates that God is in full control of human events. And the answer to that, of course, is true. God is in control of the fall and the rise of empires. And that's still true today as we take a look at what's happening around the world, like North Korea or in, um, in the UK or the United States, God is still in control of human events through the rise and fall of empires and the fulfillment of prophecies as mentioned in Daniel and also in Revelation, which we study on Saturdays at 3 p.m. Okay, so let's talk about a fact 
The stories in the book of Daniel are not just bedtime stories. As a matter of fact, as you look at the narratives of the stories found in Daniel, those are really forewarnings. Those are actually prophecies given to God's people in the end time. And it describes what you and I can expect if we remain faithful to Jesus. So the narratives, the stories that you're actually reading are all prophetic. In other words, those same issues that we will see in those Bible stories will actually be applicable because it will repeat itself in the end times, which could be starting now in 2020. All right, another fact is that false worship will be enforced. So just as in Daniel, we saw that false worship will be enforced and that true worship will be forbidden. We will see that same type of issue rise again in the last days where people in our day today will have to make a choice whether they will worship the true God of heaven or worship um, a false God. So we're going to see these issues come up uh, once again. So let's talk a little bit about the great image setup. So just as a review, um, let's just do a quick little description on the image that Nebuchadnezzar, now you remember he had the dream in Daniel 2, he, he was told that he was the head of gold. So as we enter Daniel chapter 3, verse 1, he said, my kingdom will live forever. So he made a whole image, but he did it all of gold, representing that if he can get the whole world to worship just him and the head of gold, that he would be the only kingdom. So here we see a description that this image was made of solid gold. Its height was three score cubits. And then we discover that the breadth was six cubits. Um, he set it up in a part of ancient Babylon in Iraq today called the Plain of Dura so that a lot of people can see it coming uh, from far distance. Who were invited to the dedication of that image? So we discover in Daniel that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar um, required all the princes of Babylon, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, all the rulers of the provinces to come and bow down and worship. So you notice here that it hit all aspects of leadership in the government, everyone from royalty to the governors, those who were um, placed in service in the military, those who controlled the treasury, as well as the um, the counselors, which would be uh, the wise people, maybe our, our professors today, those who were involved in law enforcement and those who were involved in enforcement of laws. So we're talking about judges and rulers and all of these different people of, of notoriety. They were um, asked to come and do something very interesting. What were all these rulers to do when all of the music sounded? So in Daniel chapter 3, verse 3 to 5, we discover that they were um, told that when they heard all the music, now remember in Babylon, it was made up of a lot of different cultures and they all spoke different languages. So rather than giving a decree that could be misunderstood, they used the music. Music is a universal language that all people can understand. And as soon as all the music instruments were played, all of these rulers and governors and sheriffs and, and judges, they were... Um, to fall down and worship that golden image, all right? Now, if you didn't fall down, what penalty would be received if you didn't worship the image? So in Daniel chapter 3, verse 6, we discover that if you didn't fall down and worship, that you would be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So there was going to be an instant punishment. So let's take a look at the summary of those events. So here we see a powerful world leader who commands a false worship. Refusal to worship, okay, is treason to the state. In other words, you're saying that you're against the government. And the basic issue that we see here is really an issue of worship and obedience. Who are you going to worship and who are you going to obey? Well, likewise, in the last days, God is saying that that same issue that we see found in Daniel chapter 3 is going to repeat itself in the last days where we will have to choose between God's law versus man's law. Are we going to worship God or worship man-made institutions? Are we going to worship um, and be obedient to God and his laws? Or are we going to be obedient to those that man sets up? Do we also notice that the law was universal? So 
uh, when the music was played, everybody would come, all nations, kindreds, peoples, and tongues of all positions were asked to fall down and worship and obey. The effort um, that we see here is where there is a combination of church and state. Now, we live in a country here in the United States where there is a good separation between church and state. But here we see that the Bible is already beginning to foretell that at some point in the future, the whole globe will be swept with this predominant issue where um, politics will be united with religion, where um, if you don't fall down and worship, you can have capital punishment because we see here that if they didn't fall down and worship, they'd be um, thrown into a fiery furnace or they would be um, put to death. Now, warning, this represents the condition in the world at the end time. This is exactly the issue that the Bible is saying is going to occur on the planet. If you don't believe it, look in history. It's always happened where people have been dominated and they were asked to worship or give homage to um, an empire or a king. So here we're talking about a real deep prophetic condition where um, the state is going to enforce some sort of religious um, um, mandate that would require people to choose whether they're going to worship God or worship a man or a man-made institution. Okay, so let's talk about this refusal to worship falsely. All right, so what charge did the Chaldeans? Now, the Chaldeans were the wise men of Babylon. So we know that there were um, three Hebrews that did not fall down and worship this image. So these wise men, the Chaldeans, made a charge against these certain Jews in Daniel chapter 3, verse 7 and 12. They said, they serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Um, what commandment then were the Jews or these Hebrew young men actually obeying? Well, they were schooled in the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 through 6, um, God wrote with his own finger in stone in the second commandment that thou shalt not have any other graven images and shall not bow down um, to these images. Thou shalt not make anything that is false and worship things that are false. So these three Hebrews were actually following the Ten Commandments. Now when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were brought before the king, Nebuchadnezzar um, had a certain countenance about him. Uh, they were uh, presented the charges and how did King Nebuchadnezzar threaten them? So we, we look at it in Daniel 3, verse 13 and 15, that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was very angry. And he said, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So he said, I'm going to give you a chance. I will allow you to fall down. But if you don't, you're going to be killed. Now, did the three Hebrews need time to think it over? In other words, they were threatened with their life. Did they say, well, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar, give me a second. Let me talk with my friends. Let us consult and then we'll get back to you. What do you think? Is that what they, what they, uh, what they did? Well, in, in uh, verse 16, we see here that the Hebrews say, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. In other words, they're just going to be bold. They're not going to be careful. They're just going to state what they say. In other words, they were so solid and so sure about this issue that they went ahead and just said to the king what they needed to say. And that is, we are not going to bow down and worship. Now, how about you and me today? Are we ready to be that confident and that bold and that sure when you and I are forced with this issue where we might have to bow down and worship a false god or a false image? Are we willing to put our life in, in danger where we could be um, killed? for our belief in God. Well, how did the Hebrews respond to Nebuchadnezzar's offer for that second chance? So you and I will be given a second chance too. Just recant God and do what we what, what everyone else is doing. Do what the majority is doing. You see, this is what Nebuchadnezzar is telling these Hebrews. Well, what was their response? Well, in verse 17 and 18, they say, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. Now, that's really bold when you just say that because obviously they've never been thrown into a fiery furnace before. 
they don't have sort of a precedent from the past that shows that God will come through for them. They were just so bold to say that our God is able to do it. If he wants to do it, he can deliver me from the burning fiery furnace. But you notice what they say, but if not, so in other words, they were willing to die. They were willing to, to give up their life for their true obedience and worship to God. So they say, but if not, we will still, we will not serve thy God nor worship the golden image. So here's the, here's the question. Are you and I so confident and bold? Are we ready to say these same kind of words in the last days if that issue comes up? Now, here's a fact. In, when we read this story, you think that the issue is really about the deliverance of the Hebrews. And really, that's just a side point. That's not even the point of Daniel chapter 3. So I want to make sure that you and I are clear on this. Deliverance is not the issue as we discover it in Daniel chapter 3. Actually, we're looking at the issue of obedience. In other words, the, the fundamental principle that Daniel is trying to present in Daniel chapter 3 is, are you going to be willing to be obedient to God in the face of death? You see, God is asking us to put ourselves in a position where we are so close to God that we um, trust God with our very life. So the issue that we see here in Daniel 3 is not about deliverance, but it's really about obedience. So in Job, you know, I, I think he says it the best in, in chapter 13, where he says, Though God slay me, yet will I trust in him but I will maintain mine own ways before him. In other words, what Job and these Hebrew um, young men are saying is my life is in the hands of God. And even though God slay me, I know it's out of love. It's out of mercy. God had a plan and there is, and there is, it's in my best interest. So in Job, he says, though he slay me, yet I will trust God. Okay, so let's take a look at this fiery furnace. So how did Nebuchadnezzar respond to the Hebrews' defense? So now obviously you would think to yourself, wow, these guys are really, they're, they're getting me upset. I, I gave them a chance and they still refused to do what I asked them to do. So in verse 19, what did Nebuchadnezzar do? Sure enough, he commanded his soldiers to make the fiery furnace seven times hotter. Now, you know, I don't know how you measure heat um, because to me, fire is fire. But here, apparently, the Babylonians found a way to make fire even hotter. Maybe they threw more wood in there, so it was more ablaze. And because there was more fire, it elevated the temperature even more. Um, but here, the Bible says that it was seven times hotter. So, I mean, you know, I think just one time hot would be enough to kill me. But here, the Bible is very clear that it doesn't matter how hot the persecution, it doesn't matter how sure the death is, God is still going to come through. Even if that, 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 um, the chance of you dying is seven times great, like it's a guarantee, here we notice, and you're going to see, that God can still come through even in the worst of situations. So what happened to the soldiers? So here we see that you know, a lot of people said, well, maybe the, the fire furnace wasn't that hot. Well, here we see that when the soldiers grabbed Shedrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they took the he those those three Hebrews, the soldiers threw them into the fiery furnace. In um, verse 22, it was told that even the soldiers, it was so hot that the soldiers themselves were actually slain. In other words, it was so consuming that you know, um, just a week ago, I went camping with my family. I took them up because we're in this pandemic. We have to be away from people. So I, uh, we built a little um, campfire. We had some firewood, and it was pretty hot, actually. You know, we had to be careful that the kids didn't get too close to it. Uh, but, you know, you kept at a distance, and you were safe. If you got a little bit too co uh, close, you might, you know, get a little bit hot, but you were still careful. Now, this fire was so hot that when the soldiers took the Hebrews just to get them close enough to throw them in, that the soldiers themselves actually died. In other words, this was a super hot fire, okay? Now, how were the three Hebrews thrown into the fire, uh, the fiery furnace? So you might think that they were gingerly tossed in, right? Well, here, look at verse 23. The, um, it says that they fell um, down and they were bound. So in other words, they were tied up, their hands, probably they couldn't move. 
Um, they probably couldn't like move their feet. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that it would be sufficient enough to just throw these guys into the fiery furnace. But Nebuchadnezzar wanted to make sure, okay, that they couldn't escape. All right. Now the soldiers themselves couldn't even escape when they just threw them in. But Nebuchadnezzar wanted to make sure that the fire was seven times hot, that these three Hebrews were bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Now here's the here's the point though. God wants you to know that it doesn't matter if your hands and feet are tied. It doesn't matter if you're if you're in the face of seven times heat of persecution and suffering and loss. Okay, we notice something very interesting in the story that um, God does something for his people in the midst of this fire. When Nebuchadnezzar looked inside the fiery furnace again, you remember he threw three in, his soldiers died. He looked into the fiery furnace and what did he see? So we read in verse 24 and 25 that he looked in and they were loose. In other words, all of the, the bounds, the ropes were already loose, okay? And they were walking in the midst of the fire and they had no hurt. All right, so they were walking in this fire and they had no more ropes around them because the fire burned the ropes. It didn't burn their hat. It didn't burn their, their coats. It didn't even burn their hair. They were just hanging loose in this fire. This tells you several things. Number one, God is able to overcome physics. In other words, when you and I are confronting some pretty um, impossible situations, God will move a mountain. He can split an ocean. He can quench a fiery furnace right before people's eyes and the fire is still burning. And he can be very too specific about the impact that he wants on his people. In this case, the fire only burned the ropes, nothing else. All right. And the other thing we learn from this is that not only does God free you from the bounds or the binds that keep us prisoners, but he frees us from those things so that way we can walk freely even in the midst of that persecution without any worry, without any hurt. We'll stand in, in awe and amazement that here we are in this fiery persecution and yet we're walking loose and everyone's standing back looking in total amazement because we are not being hurt. All right, so remember, the, the stories that we're seeing in Daniel is a, a message of hope and a message of prophecy that you can rely on in the last days. But I want to know I want you to notice something here. Nebuchadnezzar looks a second time. He looks into the fiery furnace and how many men did Nebuchadnezzar see in the fire? Remember, he threw in three, but how many did he see? The Bible tells us that he actually saw four men. <laughs> can you imagine that? So he threw in three, but he looked and he saw four. So the question that we ask in um Daniel is who was that fourth person? Who was that extra person who Nebuchadnezzar saw with his own eyes, this pagan heathen king who didn't even believe in the God? He was taught about God of heaven in Daniel 2. Okay, he looks in and who is that fourth one in the fire with the three Hebrews? Okay, he looks a little bit closer. It's the son of God. And here's the question. How did Nebuchadnezzar know who the son of God was? Well, you remember he had the vision of the dream in Daniel 2 when the image um, was before him in his dream. He saw this stone that was cut out without human hands and it struck at the image and it grew. And then it says there in that image that God's kingdom was set up. See, Nebuchadnezzar had a vision of the son of God in that earlier chapter. And now he sees him in real life standing there with the Hebrews in the midst of a fiery furnace. Now. How did Nebuchadnezzar address Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when he called them out of the fire? So all of a sudden, you remember, the king was so angry. These guys wouldn't bow down. They wouldn't worship. Throw them in. Let's kill them, right? And he, and he looked with astonishment at these four people. Now, look at his tone. How did he address them? Okay. Um, you servants of the Most High God. You know, you can almost imagine him. You know, before that, he was like, throw them in. And now... Um, servants of the Most High God, come, you know. So all of a sudden, there's this massive conversion that Nebuchadnezzar has. He's seeing a miracle right before his eyes, and he recognizes that these three Hebrews who refuse to bow down to this image, they are servants of the Most High God. 
Okay? Now, after seeing this display of God's power, seeing that God was able to save these three Hebrews, what decree did Nebuchadnezzar make? So as we come to the close of Daniel chapter 3, and we see in verse 27 and 30 that Nebuchadnezzar um, had these words, that every people, nation, and language. Okay, so you remember at the beginning, um, every people, nation, language, and every ruler, and magistrate, and sheriff, and treasurer, and judge, they were all to worship this golden image. And now to that same group of people who bowed down to the image, here's what he says to them, that every people, nation, language, which speak anything, okay, amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that something would happen, that they will be, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, he goes back to his old ways, that they will be cut into pieces, all right? They're going to be torn apart. And their houses will be made into a dunghill. You know, a dunghill, what that is, it's like the latrine. It's like the toilet. So their homes would be made into a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. So Nebuchadnezzar sets up this image. He requires the whole world to come and worship this image of himself. Three Hebrews. Uh, so you notice it's a small group of people amongst this massive majority, which means that in the last days, there will only be a minority of people. I hope you and I are in that minority where we will refuse to bow down and falsely worship a false god. We see that the king gets angry. He throws them into this fiery furnace. God is there with them. He delivers them. Then King Nebuchadnezzar makes this decree that there is no other god than the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So, Universal truth. Did you know that history loves to repeat itself? There is no new thing under the sun, especially at the time of the end. So let's take a look now at the correlating prophecy from Daniel chapter 3 and what we see in Revelation chapter 13. So now we're going to um, kind of move forward in time to about six to 700 years where John the Revelator, who never met Daniel, He's writing now a vision that God gave him about this image that we see again um, to a beast. So in um, Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 and 12, what does the two-horned beast command the people of earth to do? So there we see two beasts in, the, in that prophecy of Revelation 13. The second beast comes up and he commands the people of the earth to do something very similar to what Nebuchadnezzar, what we just read Nebuchadnezzar do. To worship the first beast. So there's one beast that will rise. A second beast will rise up after it. And will force the whole world to worship that first beast. Okay. So we see that in the last days. This issue of worship is going to be the same. Now notice the correlation here. After bringing fire down from heaven. And performing other miracles. What does this beast declare the people should make? Now notice this. Revelation 13, uh, 13, verse 13 and 14 says that an image to the beast will be formed. So we see the exact same language and the correlation of symbols from Daniel chapter 3. We're finding it again in Revelation chapter 13. Now look at what in verse 15 it says. What are people asked to do to the image of that beast? And there it says that we are to worship. So what we saw in Daniel chapter 3 is exactly the same issue that the, that the people at the end of time, and we don't know when that's going to be, but I believe it could be very soon, this issue of worship where the church and state will be reunited. They'll be united and there'll be these decrees where worship will be mandated at the state level. So what will happen to those who refuse to worship that image of the beast? So you remember what happened to the three Hebrews. You remember, if they refuse to worship the image, Nebuchadnezzar told them that you will die. Well, what does the Bible say in Revelation chapter 13, verse 15 of the people of the end times? What will happen if you refuse to worship the image of the beast? It says here that they will be killed. It's exactly the same story. So what we see in Daniel 3 is exactly what's going to happen in the end times. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 through 7, then takes us further in that prophecy. What other restrictions will be placed upon those who refuse to worship the beast and receive his mark? 
So there'll be more restrictions, okay, that would be placed on those who refuse to worship this false image. Okay, check this out. That they will not be able to buy or to sell unless they have a mark. Now, you might have thought up to this point, if I were to say this in 2019, that this would happen, you would have said, impossible. This could never happen, particularly in the United States. And yet you see, after this global pandemic, there is a lot of talk about how to control the economics from crashing into a depression. So the way they're doing it is now you can't even go into places like Walmart or Sam's Club or get gasoline unless there's only a certain amount of people who can go in. Um, they have to number the amount of people who go in for social distancing. Um, people aren't even using cash now. They're using credit cards where um, it's controlled electronically at the bank level. Here it says that there's going to come a time in the future where if you refuse to bow down and worship this false image that you will not be able to buy or sell unless you receive a mark, a code on you as a person. All right. When the beast calls for people to worship and worship its image, whom does God ask them to worship? So at that time when all of this is happening, we, we discover in the following chapter in Revelation 14 verse 7 that we are to worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. So it's very clear here where we will have a choice. We can either worship this beast, this man-made image or this, this um, institution that's created by man. Or we can follow what God says in the book of Revelation and in the book of Daniel where we worship the creator. How do we know who to worship? It's the one who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water, the creator of the universe. That is the God who we serve. That is the God who we worship. So we go on now into Revelation 15. Where will those who get the victory over the beast and his image ultimately stand? Well, you remember what happened to the three Hebrews. Nebuchadnezzar saw that Christ was in the fiery furnace with them. Now, that's an important point. Sometimes God will not promise that he will deliver you from the fire, but he promises that he will be with you in the fire and there he will protect and he will deliver you. Now, you notice in the last days, it's the same thing. God may not uh, protect you from that persecution or from the fire, but he says that he will be in the fire with you to protect you there. So where will those who get the victory over the beast those who get the victory over the image ultimately stand. And we notice in Revelation 15 too that they will have the promise of being um, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven where they will be walking on the sea of glass. In other words, in heaven. Friends, this is um, a very important question I have to ask you. Are you willing to make serving God the chief priority of your life just like the three Hebrews? Because those same issues that those three young men experienced way back 2,600 years ago is going to repeat itself here in the next several years. Here we are in the last days and this issue of worship and the issue of not being able to buy or sell. So um, there's going to be a control over the economy, a control over what you can eat, okay, what you can buy. But are you willing to overcome all of that fear, over all of that persecution, over all of that panic? over all of that uncertainty and unknown and still serve God and make God the chief priority of your life. If you are willing to do that, I'm gonna ask you to pray with me right now. Father in heaven, I pray for those who are bowing their heads, who are listening to this live broadcast right now. Father, we pray that each person who is praying at this moment um, will dedicate their life to you and make you chief and priority over our life in spite of the uncertainty and the fear and the pan panic that's being produced by all of these disasters. When persecution occurs, Lord, we pray that we can stay true to obeying your will and keep your commandments. So Lord, I pray for every person who's hearing this voice right now, that you will bless them with more knowledge and wisdom and help them to be committed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, let's go through a quick little summary here of what we just learned in uh, tonight's lesson. All right, so first of all, we discovered counterfeits will appear the same as the truth at the end times. 
In other words, there's going to be um, God's word and there's going to be Satan who will um, bring up a false image and will require people to choose between God who created heaven and earth and everything in it or worship this institution or a man-made uh, person. We also discovered in tonight's uh, lesson that we are warned about a coming uh, fulfillment of a prophecy where there will be a union between religion and faith and the churches, okay? And I'm not talking about just the, a Catholic church. I'm also including into this Judaism and Hinduism and Protestantism. All of these beliefs and faiths, okay, will unite and that faith base will unite with the enforcement of the state. In other words, a government will force um, a unification between the um, how worship is actually um, occurring. And if you don't think that this is true, take a look at this pandemic. The government is already closing churches. The government is already putting pastors in prisons for keeping services going because they're not um, abiding by social distancing. So they're doing it in the in the rationale of public safety and public um, security. So we notice that in the last days, this is going to happen, a union of church and state, and we're given that warning. We're also um, very interested to see in tonight's lesson that rather than deliverance, obedience is the real issue of the last days. So we're going to be faced with that same choice. Who are you going to serve? Who are you going to obey? Fourthly, we discovered that we will remain faithful only if we have an obedient relationship with Jesus now. In other words, it's important that we establish that walk with Christ and establish that relationship with God right now before all of the big trials come. Because if you think what we're dealing with now with this pandemic is bad, just wait till you see what's coming. Because the Bible says that there's more, that what we're seeing now is just the beginning of problems, that what we're about to face is even greater. So are you prepared? Do you have Christ at the center of your life and your family's life? Are you in full reliance on God? Because as we can see here, there will be another test. And um, I pray that we can all pass that big test when it comes. We also saw that there is a, a very close connection and a correlation between the prophecies found in Daniel, in this case, Daniel chapter 3, and those prophecies found in Revelation, in this case, Revelation chapter 13. What we're noticing here is that it's the same God, it's the same faith, it's the same message. What was given to Daniel about the end times correlates with what God told John the Revelator in Revelation. So this is why we study both books and then we, we use the Gospels and the other parts of the Bible to explain um, and bring it all together and bridge it all together. We let the Bible interpret itself. Now, next week when we get back together, we're going to look at how this future conflict results um, in choice, but results in conversions. So we're going to look at the book of Daniel, and we're going to see something very fascinating about what the book of Daniel, what God needs us to know uh, about the conversion of people in the last days. And we're going to see it happen exactly in our day to day. So uh, just to let you know, for example, this, this live session I'm doing right now, is actually being viewed by more people than if I would have been um, speaking in a building somewhere here in Phoenix, Arizona. So we see here that this pandemic, this conflict, has resulted in many curious people find, trying to discover, does the Bible say anything about it? And I've got people who are bringing their lives closer, their family lives closer into a relationship with Jesus. So we're going to be um, looking more at this next week. Again, I want to thank everyone for joining me, and um, I want to invite you back tomorrow um, to join me at 11 o'clock um, on um, YouTube, um, Chandler Media Ministry, and then at 3 o'clock for Revelation Prophecy Seminar right here on this Facebook page. So until then, God bless everyone, and um, I'll see you next time.